with great pleasure we present Laura Renard, uh, our co-researcher of the English Teaching in the Early Years project that British Council and Nile produced last year, 2017. In this opportunity, Laura is going to talk about the bilingual child. Hello, good afternoon. Today we are here to discuss bilingualism and as you can see the title of this short presentation is to agree on bilingualism. Uh, my name is Laura Renard, I work in the University of um, Nacional de, Buenos Aires, de Quilmes in Buenos Aires in an instituto pedagogico called uh, Dr. Science and I work for Nile in the UK. Um, well, the first thing we have to discuss is just a question that you are going to answer uh, online if you can. Uh, what is bilingualism for you? The first question is, what does it mean to be bilingual for you? Uh, are you bilingual? If yes, you have to tell us what languages you speak. Um, number three is, what makes you think you are or you are not bilingual? Um, according to you, how does someone become bilingual? And number five is, when a child mixes languages, what do parents usually say? All these questions uh, may have answers in the succeeding uh, slides you're going to share with me. Uh, first of all, we're going to start by those myths about being bilingual. Uh, look at number one. There is a myth, a very widespread myth, that says that learning two languages confuses the children and lowers their intelligence. Number two says that a child should learn a language properly first and then he or she can start learning another language. Number three says that there are, uh, that real bilinguals never mix languages. All, as we said before, all these are myths, right? We have to take them as things that people say but they haven't been proved. Um, what else do they say? Well that there aren't too many real bilinguals and that there's only child bilingualism and because you can't learn a language in adulthood. And another myth goes a bilingual person knows two languages equally well and proficiently. And the last, and the last but not least, the one that really worries teachers is that bilinguals do not have an accent in either of their languages. Uh, why do we say that these are myths? These are, as we said before, these are things people say with no um, research uh, backing to, to clarify or to justify all these answers. Um, so we're going to see now. Um, children are the title of this presentation is The Bilingual Child. So when do you think that children were, uh, began to be studied as bilinguals? Well, apparently it was long, long time ago. Uh, in 1913 by a linguist, a French linguist called Jules Rongeat, who started studying uh, bilingual children who spoke French and German, for example. And in that very old uh, book that you can find online easily. Um, the beginning of bilingual education has, was settled. For example, he had advocated that children had to speak, parents uh, had to speak one language to each child. For example, if the father speaks German and the mother speaks um, French, each of them will keep that language to the children, right? Languages could not be mixed what is now called one parent, one language. And Ranjat also establishes the, the basis saying that a child begins to identify two languages at the age of three approximately, which was later on uh, tested with uh, research. Well, can we give a definition of bilingualism? If we go very much back in time, we can say, well, in the times of structuralism, Bloomfield established this idea that being bilingual meant uh, perfect control of two languages, native-like control, whatever native-like meant, okay? In those days, 
to speak like a native speaker was the thing, although we couldn't say or we couldn't tell who was the native speaker to be uh, imitated. Uh, that was a very strict view and of course nobody could meet that objective because we cannot speak like native speakers, especially if we are not. Uh, in the 60s, the swing of the pendulum went towards the other end and said that if you had a minimal competence um, in one of the languages, in one of the, sorry, in one of the four skills, you could be considered bilingual, uh, which made practically everybody <laughs> bilingual, trilingual, quadrilingual. Later on in 1971, Taitong comes with this uh, very significant um, explanation that talks about the moment in which an, a speaker is independent. So being bilingual means to have the capacity to speak a second language but moving away from your native language. And that is, for example, without the need to paraphrase, right? When you don't know a language, you are thinking of the words of how to translate. If you can speak the foreign language independently, that means you have begun uh, to be bilingual. More modern definitions talk about uh, people who use two or more languages or dialects. We have to make room for dialects, for regional varieties, for uh, local languages. Um, and so people mix, sorry, do not, the word is not mix. People uh, alternatively use one language or the other. Uh, it may be a standard language and a dialect, for example, of that same variety. And then um, a more precise uh, view says that the skills you, it, bilingualism, is the skilled use of each language for particular situations. So you may be very fluent in one area and not so fluent in the other language in another area. Um, please. How do you become bilingual? Well, uh, it's a very uh, difficult thing to def define, but because it is a multidimensional phenomenon, okay? So for example, if we follow Baker, Valdez and Figueroa in 1994, uh, we have established the parameters for this. According to age, you can be simultaneous, sequential, or late bilingual. So if your parents spoke two languages, you were a simultaneous bilingual. If you started acquiring a language later on in life, like my case, for example, when I was eight, I started studying English. Now I was a sequential because my first language was finished by then, completely acquired, and then I started with English, or late, adults, people who start learning the language later. According to the ability you have to learn the language, you are incipient, you have a small amount of bilingualism, or the case of many immigrants, for example, receptive bilinguals. My mother understands perfect Italian, she cannot speak Italian, so because she comes from an Italian family. So then, uh, she is considered, for example, a receptive bilingual. Um, and some other people are considered productive bilinguals. They can speak the language, the two languages. According to the balance of two languages, if you speak two languages, you are um, dominant in one or the other, okay? Um, according to the d area of development, if you continue studying English, for example, or if you, if you continue developing your English, you are an ascendant bilingual. If you stop studying, if you stop reading, or if you don't pay attention to it for a long time, your language becomes recessive, okay? According to the context, well, if you live in a place where the language is spoken, um, uh, the language is endogenous, so you are a an endogenous bilingual, you live inside the community. If the language you speak is, like in my case, from another country, well, my bilingualism is exogenous, right? And according to the circumstances, and here we um, come again to, um, to talk about immigration, for example. Um, probably, in our case, we are elective bilinguals. One, our parents, wanted us to learn English to get a better job in the future, for example. So that was an election. We wanted to study. But there are so many other people in the world that become bilingual 
under circumstances, and these are what they are considered circumstantial bilinguals, people who had to emigrate, people who had to move countries, uh, look for better jobs, a great amount of people. And another category that doesn't belong to Valdez and Figueroa, but to Hammers and Blanc, who are Canadian, is the status. Uh, you can have additive bilingualism depending on what languages you speak and some other languages that are not considered so, uh, uh, they don't have such a wide status, they are told considered subtractive, okay? So, what is additive bilingualism? Well, we talk about additive bilingualism uh, as, uh, according to Cummins, Cummins is a, a linguist uh, of Irish descent. He works in Canada and he's a leading figure in this subject. He says it's a form of bilingualism that results when students add a second language to their intellectual toolkit while continuing to develop their native language, okay? Now, if you consult the Council of Europe, the Common European Framework, everybody talks about additional languages. We, the definition of first language, second language, third language is not so much in fashion at the moment. It's additional. So you learn your native language and then you learn additional languages later on. Well, and here, Another figure in bilingualism is Miguel Siwan, uh, a Catalan writer. Um, here is a definition in Spanish, and it's a definition in the negative, as you can see. Bilingüismo no es el dominio perfecto e idéntico de dos lenguas, sino de la capacidad de utilizar dos o más lenguas en distintos contextos y con distintas modalidades. And here, of course, we go back to the idea of uh, including dialects, of course. Um, well, what happens in the child's brain, poor thing? Because uh, one of the myths that we discussed at the beginning was that the children would be confused, that their intelligence would be lower, that all sorts of terrible things would be happening. In the beginning, it was thought that you had English in one side of the brain and Spanish, for example, in another side of the brain, right? It was believed that languages took two separate rooms. Um, that there was a separate underlying proficiency. Can we see the next one, please? But in fact, and again we have to read Cummins, um, he talks about the iceberg theory or the central operating system. All the languages we have, or the ability of language, uh, is one, okay? It is together and it what we can see, what comes up, is either one language or the other, but that in the brain, they all, um, they are all, everything is together. So, kids in school, what happens in school? Yeah. Uh, what is the essential in the, bi no, that's something wrong there, but anyway. <laughs> the common underlying principle should be sufficiently developed to cope with all the needs of school. But then we have this, again, Jim Cummins, Bix or Kalb, what is that? Can we see the next? What is easier to teach? Uh, or what does school train children for? This is Bix. Uh, Cummins identifies two areas of, la of bilingualism, basic interpersonal communicative skills or cognitive academic language proficiency. That's why you use the acronym, right? The basic interpersonal communicative skills has to do with the ability, the fluency one has, for example, to hold a simple conversation. Whereas the other one is the kind of language that we might use for academics, uh, for studying, uh, to talk about different subjects. And sometimes schools works too much on, on the CALP rather than on the BICS, and sometimes we get students with academic, uh, and that usually happens in teacher training college, for example, uh, students get a lot of CALP, whereas the BICS is not as strong. Well, then we have to see what is meant by bilingual education and what are the definitions. Well, a biling bilingual education talks about programs of full bilingualism, where the aim is to develop proficiency in the two languages the native language, for example, and the foreign language that is studied. 
uh, or what is called dual language maintenance because the two languages continue to be developed. Okay? None of them stops, on the contrary. One revitalizes the other. Um, at least 50% of instruction is done in the second language um, so, that, so, so that the program is regarded as immersion. Um, we talk about bilingual, biliterate programs, if, which implies the training of all language skills in the two languages. And there you have the reference. It's again Fred Genesey, another Canadian author, but highly regarded in this area as well. Well, the child may use each language for specific purposes with certain people with and for certain topics, right? It's very unusual that a bilingual uses all the areas of domain in, uh, in the two languages. And then, uh, this is an interesting quote in the sense that um, sometimes parents want children to translate. Translati translation is a highly acquired skill, okay? Sometimes when you start teaching two languages, uh, parents want children to translate, uh, you know, some, something they hear in a movie or a passage of something, and uh, the translation skill is um, late acquired. Yeah. Well, what needs to be done? One serious problem in, lang in bilingual education is that there is little, little teacher training, right? The teachers are trained to teach primary school or initial education uh, or languages, but they are not specifically trained to work in bilingual schools and bilingual classrooms. Um, even if in, case in places where there are um, bilingual cities or bilingual uh, areas, there are a few courses that prepare teachers for educating bilingual children. Well, we can talk about many advantages. Uh, but one of the advantages that uh, are being discussed has to, uh, to do with the fact that being bilingual gives the child an advantage in school. It gives them like uh, wider areas of knowledge that are being used at the same time. Greater concentration, both in bilingual children and also in adults. Um, it is said that maybe managing two languages helps the brain to sharpen and to retain its ability to focus while ignoring irrelevant information. Uh, so the myths that we talked about, um, retarding uh, capa the capacity to speak and all those things are not, um, cannot be taken as true, right? Um, if you're interested in the subject, there are conferences of bilingualism carried out every two years by the ISB, International Symposium on Bilingualism. Now we are going to have symposium number 12 next year in the University of Alberta, Canada.